All right, for those of you who just walked in, there is a question on the board. So if you can figure out how to turn your clicker on, um, go ahead and, and answer just so we can get a sense of uh, what people think about this one. Um, all right. Um, everyone had a chance to answer? OK, so we have 10 responses. So, um, so a number of you, slightly more than 50%, think it would have no effect. Um, some people are very optimistic and think it would increase their salaries. And then there's just one person who is kind of pessimistic and thinks that this would actually um, negatively impact your salary, right? OK. So it's one of those questions that um, has no real answer, right? I mean, there's no right answer to this. Um, in certain departments, um, the answer is very definitely that if you were caught spending too much time on your teaching or perceived to be spending too much time on your teaching, this would negatively impact your promotion and tenure possibilities, right? And some of you in this room might be from such departments, OK? There are other departments or other institutions where, in fact, the, um, if one were to correlate the fact that increasing effort actually leads to more effective teaching or whatever kind of outcomes that you want, then in fact it could be a positive thing, right? So, um, but it's more an idea here in terms of discussion and really opening the, the floor for talking about this. Um, Diane, you wanted the right answer on this or you had some comments on this one as a question? Well, I mean, you could argue for any of the answers, but technically, if we're taking a sort of uh, statistical approach, it would have no effect because so many other things affect the increase in salary that it can't be taken down just to the one. one. That was what I was thinking Okay. in my attempts to be more numerically inclined. And if you ever have your students that deeply thinking about the choices to your answer, you've already won the game because right, exactly. they're engaged deeply in thinking about, right? Okay, all right. So um, today what, you know, the title of our, our seminar is Getting the Most Out of Your Clickers. And um, primarily what I want to leave you with is ways to think about different kinds of questions and scenarios in which you could use clickers. Obviously you saw a nice simple one where, you know, a possibly a, a slightly controversial type of uh, topic and everyone's able to vote anonymously. We were able to leave it running. People walk into the class, and there's immediately something for you to do to get engaged with the commentant of the class, right? OK, so let's get a little bit of background on all of you, OK? Um, clickers are also known as classroom response systems. So how would you respond to this question? So you'll go ahead and uh, just make sure your clicker's on, and then hit A, B, C, or D. Okay, so we got our nine, nine responses. Of, on the first question, I had responded as well as so I was a tenth person. So if you look around, you could probably count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, three, two, five. No, that's ten. Are you oh, you're clicking too? Okay, yeah. all right, there we go. We got a tenth click. All right, very good. Okay. Um, so a great way now to get some information about what's the audience like. And so on this particular topic, um, we have um, some people who have taught with clickers. Some people often used it as a student, and then the three people have never used um, clickers at all. So, so we have a wide variety of expertise, which is always good in a classroom because then we can hit multiple different levels of, of this kind of usage, right? Um, and they're the majority, the slight majority of people have actually used it as a student. Great. Okay. So, um, you know, if you read stuff about clickers, right, it's not about the clicker. I mean, the technology is there. The technology is in a, in a enabling technology, but it's really what you do with the clicker. So I hope what we'll spend our, the rest of this time together doing is I'll succeed hopefully in getting you mentally engaged in some of these applications and the kinds of questions is really what we're going to be about um, and uh, the kinds of things that you could potentially do. Um, and since we have expertise in the room, I always welcome people to chime in um, if there's something that you'd like to contribute. I do have a little handout, tips for successful clicker use, um, that I'll give you towards the end of the session. <clears throat> so some of the motivation for clickers really started with the, the NRC Council Report, How People Learn. Um, this is the expanded edition, came out in 2000. It really put together uh, a bunch of research from cognitive psychology, educational psychology, from research in the disciplines related to teaching and learning. 
um, about, and it's all under the umbrella of the learning sciences, which was as a discipline kind of started to emerge in the, the late 19s, um, early 2000s. And um, at the same time, the technology started to become available. I started using wireless clickers in 1999. It was the first set I ever used. And um, so people started to realize that if you try to really understand how people learn, we need some formative tools to help us. I'll let you read that. Right? Some of you may have done college essays. College essays, once upon a time, used to have that as a topic, right? OK. And so um, how do we have two-way conversations with students, right? So clickers, you know, have they're, they're quick and easy. They have a the nice kind of, they fit in your hand. And there's lots of ways to get feedback from students on a number of these dif different aspects of learning. Prior knowledge, right? So we got some prior knowledge. I learned about how you guys, uh, what your experience is with clickers, so that gives me some information about that. Preconceptions, misconceptions, opinions, understanding, confusion, and satisfaction, right? So these are just some of the overall types of things you could probe, okay? Um, you know, happy clicker user, uh, pensive clicker user, you know, not very happy clicker user, I don't know, so you, you, get, you get all kinds, so, okay. So let me test your scientific knowledge. You seen this one before? No. Okay. Go ahead and answer this. Sometimes students walk into your classroom, right? Beverly people like, we got some technical people here. Uh, Marcello, Jeffrey. I'm going to give you 10 more seconds to respond <clears throat> because we have to cover so much material in this class. I can't waste too much time on this. It's a big, thick textbook. We're already in like week three, and I'm still stuck on chapter two. So I need to. So I need four more people to respond quickly. Otherwise, you're going to lose your points for the day. No extra credits. No extra cookies for you. Okay. Boom. See how fast that was? Okay. You don't have to press send. For the multiple choice, you just have to click the, the response. OK, yeah. So, OK. So, all right. So um, just like our expertise level with uh, clicker usage, we have this varied expertise level. So what I'd like you to do is um, turn to your neighbor, especially somebody maybe you don't know, haven't talked with much, try to find somebody, and try to convince your neighbor to change their answer to your answer. OK, I'm going to give you like 60 seconds to do that. So try to find somebody that you haven't talked to before. All right, we're going to re-poll. Go ahead, if you've changed your, go ahead and answer the same question again. Hopefully you guys have now le reached some consensus. Maybe not, maybe you're more confused. So you can go back to your seats and go ahead and re-answer the question. Let's see what you guys came up with, OK? Were you able to convince? We were able to convince him. Ashley, we were able to convince him. Right. How about you guys? Was there some change of answers? You changed yours answer based on his arguments. Okay, how about you guys? We didn't change. You didn't change. No, I don't think we changed. You stayed with what you had. I think we Which was the same or different? Different. It was different. So, okay. You didn't beat her over the head with a stick? No, no, she didn't beat me either. Okay, all right, okay. How about you guys? Was there a change? No. You both had the same thing? Okay, oh. so we're obviously, I'm not succeeding very well in getting people to come to consensus. Okay, let's, let's um, actually English professors do the best on this question re usually. Let's make sure we get back to 10 responses. Everyone please respond. Oh, we gotta do it again. We gotta do it again, right? Okay, thank you. All right, so, um, so you know, we remember, so, <laughs> The nice thing about the software, and I'll show you these things as we go along, right? So question three, if you look at the top, question three, this is what we started with, okay? Question four, we have now, you know, we've, we've come together, right? A's and B's, it's pretty much a bimodal distribution, right? Most people are in the A and B kind of category, okay? And I didn't have to teach you anything about bracturation or quasiling or any of this kind of stuff, right? So there was a, there's a, actually a, um, an astronomer, Doug Duncan out of Colorado, whose question this is, and he got it from somewhere else. But um, so, um, can we quickly hear? Um, Ashley, 
what you guys come up with if you had the same answer and why did you come up with it? Um, so I think I originally had C and she originally, what did you have? I had C, you had B. Oh yeah, I had B, yeah. And so then we both reread it together and because neither of us were sure of our answers and then we both came to the conclusion of A. Okay. <laughs> so we went with neither of our responses originally. Okay, okay. So just from a learning point of view, two students had different points of view. They read something together, they engaged with the material together, and then they made a choice that they could both agree with. Okay, how about you guys over here? Yeah, same thing. I, I had B at the beginning, we had B. Okay. Now we read it, we came now to B. B. Yeah. So they came to now to A, you now came to B. Okay, all right. We, um, we came down to A because what she was saying makes sense. We read it. Okay. And maybe we're all right. Okay. Great stuff, you're all rereading together, coming up with consensus, good learning stuff is happening, right? Okay, um, how about the correct answer? Imad, you wanna, what did you guys have over there? I had a C, but he got an A. So what'd you do, take the average of the two? <laughs> <laughs> okay, my answer would be B. B as in boy. Boyd, I guess we should change that too, okay. All right. How is Traxelin quazelled, right? This is why English professors are good, because it's really a syntactic analysis, what it comes down to. This is nonsense, right? But it's a great question for faculty development. So because now if you're a physicist or a chemist or a plant person, plant pathologist or whatever, it doesn't really matter. It's you have to work through this, right? And I just use this as a reminder for faculty. Sometimes students come into our classrooms. We're putting stuff up that we've been doing for 20 years. Right, it's second nature. The vocabulary means so much to us, and they look at it, and this is what they see. Okay, <laughs> so it's pretty much what they see, and this is the sentence: Bracter it to quazel traxeline. How is qua traxeline quazeled via bracteration? Okay. All right. So that's one kind of question where it's just to get their attention and your attention. Okay, and. You, in a larger group, sometimes we have a better, um, what was the last group I did this with? Uh, I can't remember what group I did this with. They, they actually, after the initial one, came to B um, more con as a greater consensus, like 70% people got B. Okay, um, so part of what we did here was peer instruction, right? So this whole idea, it's a think-pair-share type of activity. And the, you know, the process that we went through was that, you know, asked a question, you thought about it and responded individually, right? So that's an important step to really get the individual buying into their response, right? Because then you actually care to find out what the, the right answer is. Um, number four here, we viewed the histogram, the initial histogram. Some people don't show that. Um, as an instructor with the eye clicker, you can actually get the percentages right here. Okay, so you can see if 90% people choose one choice and you think that's the correct answer, you could just move on. It says, okay, everyone got this concept, let's move on. Okay, so you can make that choice. I like to show people the histogram. I like histograms, so I think they're pretty colored things. So we could show them. Then we discussed with the neighbor, re-voted on the question, and then we viewed the results. And now you have a teaching decision to make, right? So do we go on and talk more about, you know, Traxeline? Because you guys clearly didn't get the concept the first time I lectured on this, right? Um, so on and so forth, okay? Um, and the reason I show Eric Mazur's picture is because this is also a plug for the fact that he's actually coming to Auburn September 19th. And he is gonna talk about assessment. And um, then at 12.30, there's a big um, lunch keynote. And then Marcello over there is actually hosting him for a physics seminar in the physics department later on. Okay, so, um, so the clickers enable feedback to the instructor about the student's understanding. And then if you actually share the data with students, right, this now gives, if somebody is in the 7%, Right, they might think they're in the minority, but if the 7% is correct, then they know, hey, everybody else in the class is confused and I know the stuff, right? Or the other way around. Everybody else seems to have gotten it. I clearly need to do some work to connect. And it's anonymous. Some of you may be familiar with Bloom's taxonomy. I just put this up there just to think about the different kinds of questions that people sometimes ask. Um, and so this is just a way to um, categorize different types of questions that we might ask. Um, and a lot of the understanding application analysis are very often very, use, very um, appropriate categories for clicker questions. Okay, just asking people to recall stuff is sometimes not a great clicker question because it's just like a yes, no answer. A Little bit of controversy, a little bit of spread in the histogram. 
gets you more stuff to talk about. So the general um, category um, so, uh, that Eric Mazur kind of um, made famous in terms of the type of assessment to do with um, clickers, concept tests are sort of single concept questions. Okay? So I'm going to, and it's an opportunity for students to demonstrate their understanding. So I'm going to give you something else from an area that you may not be terribly familiar with. Go ahead and respond to this question. So up in the top right hand corner you can see that we have the counter, right? We know the counter needs to get to 10, okay, 9 or 10. Um, this is the timer. You can have the timer either count up or count down. So if there is a time sensitive thing where you really need students to be able to process something and do it in X amount of time, and if you're planning your whole lesson, then you can actually have that timer count down. For these kinds of sessions, I usually let it count up. All right, so we, remember we used to have 10, and now it's nine, okay? That's okay, one person's fallen asleep or somebody's you know, clicker's turned off, um, but that's also, it gives you sort of an attendance count without really having to think about it. If you don't, you know, on these clickers it actually tells you there's a little check mark that your response was received, but um, you can always re-vote. As long as the question's open, it'll just rewrite your last answer. So that's why that number doesn't go up, okay. So let's see. How, how much time would you allocate for like one minute to minute? So in this particular case, I noticed that no one responded till 23 seconds had elapsed, right? So it was like everybody was glued to the question, was reading it and processing, right? Um, depending on the, it all depends on the complexity of the question, right? If it's a single concept thing like this, or something based on their reading that you expect them to be familiar with, a minute's good enough to get a sense of most of the people, right? Some people are still gonna be daydreaming when the question's up, but if you have a class of like 100 people and you get 80 plus percent of the people answering within a minute, you say, that's good enough, I will have good statistics out of this, we're gonna move on. And that also sends a message to everybody, hey, if I wanna get my clicker points in, I need to be awake and listening to see what's going on. Yeah, so that pacing's all up to you, and you will get a sense of your class. Okay, but I did want to make a note of that, that you know, we could really tell in this one, no answers came in until 23 seconds had elapsed. Everyone is reading and processing it okay. because it was an unfamiliar kind of topic. So we have 90% on A and um, so one person on C, right? So what should I do with this? Pardon? That can't be right, by the way. Well, can I know write? because I chose D. Mm -hmm. Sure. Really? <laughs> Ooh. So there? Is it good? That is. Uh, I mean, maybe I misclicked. Maybe you misclicked. Okay. Or you A right. or C. But can we? Do we get to talk about it? Because. Okay, so, th so that's a very good question, right? So what should what instructional? Um, so even though it's ninety percent, you guys could all be off, off consensus, but wrong. Right. But everyone has a consensus. So what would you like to discuss about it? Well, I was wondering how, are, are you going to talk about confidence questions? I was wondering how confident we are with this. Because as I'm thinking about it, I want to change my answer. Like I'm thinking about pianos. Like if, and it, I answered before I fully understood the visual of when you tamp on that thing, it's going to go down, which is going to change the length of the two, like so when you tighten a snare drum, right, what does the pitch do when you tighten it? You're shortening, right? So that's what I was wondering about. Okay. Do we get right. a chance to talk about it? Or do we want to talk about confidence, like how confident we are with our answer? So I'm, what? I'm not that confident. <laughs> so um, so let's test the the brittleness of your knowledge. Okay. Right? So go ahead and find that partner that you talked to before. And now that you have this additional information from Diane, okay? Or is it? I don't know if it's true or not. I'm just working through it's it in my It's additional brain. information. Thank okay. you. Great additional information. Are you guys correct? Or with this additional information, do you want to change your answer? Let's take 30 seconds. <clears throat> so like if you're thinking about a piano, it's Do you have the same shorter. reasoning for why? And do you have the same reasoning? Those things will go down when you tamp them. They will go down. They will go down. So I'm thinking they will about move. Go down. Is it going to tighten it if you do that? 
So why? Why did you, why did you, you choose, choose the response? No, don't do that. You can go talk to them. Do you see what I'm asking? You guys could be a group of three, I guess. Right, so, but that's all about the length of the... Yeah. Drink inside. Right, it's not going to change, but it's going to create tension in a different way. So I don't know if it's. Does it. Yeah. Do I mean the end to be the end? Yeah. 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 Since we don't understand yeah. how yeah. that yeah. works. Yeah. Right, well, is it long? Like, that's the question. Is it getting tighter as it goes down? 9 to 900. Right. It turns out even like graduate so classes, the there are things right. that you can do. Room design is a huge part of making technology work. Yeah. If, if it's a pain in the neck for you to do technology stuff, then absolutely. But with the clickers, you could still get the response. Yeah. Or you can write the questions on the board. Yeah, or you can just pull it up. I used to do them just, hey, turn to chap chapter five, question, conceptual problem three. And we're just going to answer that. It doesn't go on any screen. Okay, in the interest of time, we need to um, move along. Okay, so let's go ahead and re-poll. So now that you've discussed, I've heard some people, are you more confused or less confused? Um, this is something I do talk about and um, hadn't planned, but thank you for bringing that up. That's good. Because I have had situations where you have the 90%, people discuss, and then it comes into a different distribution. So just waiting for people to get a couple more responses in here, please. Let's make sure, Monique, uh, you be sure what you're pressing. We're good? Okay, now there's our 10. Okay. Look at that. So some people moved away from A, right, as a result of discussion. Okay. You moved <laughs> again? <laughs> right, you were. You did move away from B, right, <laughs> exactly. So, um, so we have seven people on A, and so, so that happens, right? So sometimes that will happen. That's your pre-discussion. So this is one of those teaching decisions you have to make, right? Um, uh, is 90% correct? Because at this level, it's still, people could still be guessing. So, um, so the way that the tabla works, is that by hitting the pegs down, they would actually move, okay? And if you hit them all the way around, you would increase the tension on the drum head, and the pitch would go up. Uh, pitch would increase, okay? Big money! All right. Uh, there's no money involved, sorry. <laughs> all right. Completely different, but, but the point is, it was one concept. So the idea, that, right, it's just one concept linking this thing going down, the hitting this thing with what's happening. So it's a very simple cause and effect relationship we're trying to look at, okay? All right. Some of you may have heard of this guy. So now we get to vote, okay? It's just, just introducing a different kind. And notice that the answer choices are nothing fancy. Increase, decrease, and then something else, right? The C choices stays the same, irrelevant. And I wanted to show you two from ver two very different. This guy's um, in, uh, he helped create a lot of the Bush era um, public education policy. This guy, economist, okay? And he's actually a guy who lives in the ivory tower. If you've ever been at Stanford University, you know that big tower? The Hoover Institution's in there? That's where the guy's office is, or used to be. Okay. <laughs> so he's actually a really ivory tower person, okay? All right, Sarah Kanashek says, and so the answer here is really, you know, if you don't know anything, it's, it's um, okay. So it turns out that they didn't actually in include the length of the school day at all in their analyses, okay? But, but it's the more the idea is there a kind of question, right? All of you have in your fields, you can ask this kind of question. Just checking understanding, okay, does, it, does the system change? Right? Is, it not rel is the question not relevant to the system, which is what the C answer is all about? Does the system go down in some way? Does the system go up in some way? Okay, an easy question to write. Okay. All right, 
So I'm going to give you a very quick lecture on understanding diabetes, okay? So uh, the way these uh, diabetes things work, I went to somebody's doctoral dissertation the other day, right? So I learned all about this insulin signaling transduction. And so it turns out that this is the cell wall, and then you have this insulin receptor IR, and it leads to the activation of tyrosine kinase activity of the receptor. And then you have this whole chain reaction over here, these kinase chains that gives a gene expression. Okay, and then this other pathway can lead to a whole bunch of other productive things in terms of the cell uh, production of insulin. You can get protein synthesis, um, shown down here, uh, glycogen synthesis, and finally enhanced glucose transport. Okay, and all of you read about this in our reading on molecular cell proteomics, 2003. That was part of your reading for today. And so I'm going to go on and on talking a little bit more about this stuff I have absolutely no idea about. Okay, all right. So now the question is, okay, um, remember all of those little things had something in them, right? What was in here? And we're, we're doing this question because I'd like you to try out um, a way of, um, if you um, hit the, let's see, on your clickers, if you just hit the blue button on the left, it should put it into ABC123 mode, okay? And now you should be able to use the cursor keys, okay? Start with the letter A on the very first one, and then you can go up and down, okay? Use the up and down cursors, it will scroll through numbers and letters. And then if you go right and left, you can do like multi, just like old time texting. If you remember old school texting, you can do old school texting. So come up with some three or four letters, whatever you might remember from this, and then hit send. Okay, so this is the ABC123 type of thing. Everyone kind of got the basic idea how to do this? Okay. okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yes. So our friends in pharmacy often have incredibly, this is actually out of the graduate nutrition dissertation, but you know, I've gone to pharmacy classes where they put even more complicated diagrams on the board and then wonder why students don't pay attention to any of these because they provide them the, you know, the PowerPoints to go with them. But the question is how to bring students' attention back, right? And in this particular case, that thing in the middle is really crucial to the whole insulin transduc transduction process in the cell. That's what I learned from being on this person's dissertation. Yeah, yeah. Question. Would you say that clickers are here to stay, or eventually the cell phones will become the clickers? Or so. <clears throat> Pardon? In some places they already are. The Correct. Some of the, there's you can buy an app for the thing that'll work with these, right? So the eye clicker go. The reason I like clickers is because they're a single purpose device. And there are some times when just having a simple single purpose device, right? Just like, you know, the, the um, I don't know, author who just likes to have a piece of paper and a pen. That's it, nothing else you're gonna try to write, you know? There's some aspect to it. There's no other distractions that can get in the way if the clicker is just being used for this. The cell phone, you know, all those other fun things that on the cell phone are just a click away, right? It's well, just too tempting. To play devil's advocate, the reason why I would like cell phones is that I probably wouldn't give my cell phone to a friend to have it during class. And, and okay. So Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So then comes back to once again, um, you know, how, what's your teaching style and how comfortable are you that even if they have cell phones there, right? you're comfortable managing the learning process in a way that, that work, works with you. Absolutely. I mean, we have still, on this day, faculty on this campus who want to turn off Wi-Fi in certain classrooms. Okay. Can um, you turn off Wi-Fi while having click clickers? Are different? Clickers have their own, own channel. But it doesn't matter if you turn off Wi-Fi, people have cell plans, yeah, yeah. cellular, you know, you can't turn yes, off everything. There's software out there on the internet that you can sign up using your email and set up a, a question and everybody in the class can just use their cell phone to respond to mm -hmm. the question. I can't yeah. remember the name of the software that is out there. Yeah, I mean there's, there's lots of those kinds of things. But the question is, right, does it introduce an additional distraction? Could you do this with laptops, with iPads, with cell phones versus the single purpose remote, which is what this is about, right? And that's your that's that's one of those decisions. So I think having a mix available, I think the technology is important, but um, I like the the single purpose device. Yes. Can I one thing that you can do with iClickers that you can't do with Poll Everywhere or any other devices? Uh, if you wanted to have all of your quizzes be clicker quizzes, 
you can collect that data and feed it directly into your gradebook from iClicker, which I haven't been able to learn how to do yet with Poll Everywhere. Okay, So, so there's some leveraging of grades that can No, be but actually, um, if you pay for iClicker, I mean, you, probably the payment is not the issue. If you use the iClicker app, and actually Mandy's going to show us the gradebook in, in her part later on, um, but, um, and she's listening, so she's hearing these questions mm -hmm. remotely. Um, the, I think the issue is, so if, if you do the iClicker app, iClicker Go app, then you can get all that data collection, okay? Yeah. So, um, but the question is, do you have students remember or forget two devices because they'll, they'll never forget their phone, right? Mm -hmm. um, but they will forget to bring their clicker to class. Then you have to deal with this headache of, oh, I forgot to bring my clicker today. How do I get my clicker points? Right, so that, that's a logistic issue. So, okay. So you guys answered all kinds of stuff. Some, you know, some, some person wrote ABBA. So you were having fun with this. Okay. Um, but my whole point of showing this, of course, was that you can do these alphanumeric entries. Okay. All right. Um, it turns out that the, um, the actual thing that you want is AKT. Okay? AKT. No yeah, some people were close. Nobody quite got it right, yeah. but AKT, some people were pretty close to it. Okay. But, right? Okay. Question type, right? Question type, you took this right out of the textbook, just erase, put a little PowerPoint circle on top of that, and says, okay, did pe people actually look at the picture in the textbook, right? Because it's kind of a crucial thing. Um, so, noticing, make, making students notice stuff. Okay. So we recently had the World Cup. So here's another kind of uh, quick and dirty type of question. We're going to stay with um, the A, B, C, one, two, three, because I'm going to go beyond E. And so um, going to a different regime, I like pictures. Here's a graph. These are different climate zones. Uh, we actually have a South American person here. But if you watched any of the World Cup soccer, there was some games in the, in the rainforest in Manaus, which is a city right on the edge of the Brazilian rainforest, or in the rainforest. And so, you know, turn this, how, do, how does one take something like that and turn it into a clicker question? So you'll use the, the letters again, and put some letter from A through J and hit send. button to get okay. to, if you hit the blue button, it should put it in ABC, one, yeah. two, three mode. Right, we want to get out of that. We want to get back to the no. numbers down at the bottom, but right, that's the issue. Where I you just want to do a letter, so you should still be able to scroll. It's like we're stuck in alpha numeric. Is that a fair assessment, Roland? Yeah, we're stuck. Can I get this one? Yeah, I can't get my automatic set. You have to hit send. Yeah. You have to hit send. Right, but it's okay. But it's not in. See, these are the other. Like last time when I click it, when I clicked it before, it was a yep. big old A when I was clicking down here, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and this is alphanumeric. Okay. Right. Because. But how do we get out of? Like I'm trying to get out of the blue button alphanumeric. Okay. You want to be in alphanumeric because the letters could go all the way up to J. Oh, okay. If it's A B C, I can right. only get E. Is that something you're controlling you up there? Yes. Thank you. I did. See, uh, there was more than just one person confused. Okay, that's Very fine. Good. You guys were okay? Okay. All right, so everyone okay with responding? Great, okay. Hey, we picked up an 11th response. Okay, that's interesting. Okay. Um, okay, so we have, um, yeah, 54% on C. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip discussion. Um, 
Uh, C is the correct answer, a lot of rainfall, right, uh, precipitation, and you, this is temperature, so this is one of those things, are students paying attention? So that's why I picked this one, because notice the temperature goes, the, it goes, it's reversed, right? So the high temperatures are over here, the low temperatures are over there, and those of us who've taught physics have found out students very often don't pay any attention to the labeling of the axes. <laughs> so using right ways to get students to pay attention to labeling of the axes is, is good. Great, okay. Um, Part of the reason to have this is the play it again Sam thing, which is use that same picture again, right? Once you've prepared something, you can use uh, a rich kind of thing like that um, for um, multiple questions. So if I give you the flip side of that question, okay? Um, some of you might know Chris Berman, ESPN football commentator. That's just to add local color. Um, you don't need anything, but um, what do you think? The frozen tundra would be. Mikhail, are you from the real frozen tundra? Not quite. Not really, no. Almost, <laughs> Almost yes. There's somebody from actually from the tundra region. Actually, I live in Alaska. You live in Alaska. There you go. That's how you got the. <laughs> when we guess, can we change? Sure. You can respond as many times as, as long as the question's running, you can answer as many times as you like. So we have a bunch of people saying J, some people saying H, some people saying G. So somebody who said J, why'd you say J? If you wanna own up to your answer, if you don't, that's okay. It's cold, okay. So just because it's really cold, right? So a lot of cold and actually not very much precipitation. Okay, okay, how about somebody who said H? Coldish and kind of, it's on the coldish kind of area, yeah, yeah, okay. And this particular J was the correct answer, okay. And um, so the way you could just let students come to their own conclusions also with this is after you're done, not even have to spend time really discussing very much, just put the, this was the original from The Economy of Nature, sixth edition, Freeman and Company, okay. So reusing assets, right, in multiple kind of ways, that's the idea behind here, okay. I'm sorry for all these science things. The science kind of stuff is all I know. They make some great, great clicker questions. But we have a couple of other ones coming up. Okay, so you've all seen oak trees, hopefully. And even I, who know nothing about, oh, we actually have plant people here, right? Are you, no, are you entomologist? Are you plant side or entomologist? Plant side. Plant side, there you go. All right, this is perfect. We have a real expert here. And another one on this side, plant pathologist. Very good. So where does the most of the mass of the tree come from? That is what your answer. I'm gonna set it back to ABC mode, the just A, B, C, D, E mode, okay? So I'm clicking, when I am click up in the top left-hand corner, that's setting what kind of responses. So you should be okay, or hit the blue button, and again, it should reset it. A, B, C, D, or E. All right, we got 10 responses, fabulous. Oh, 11, even better. And we're all over the board. Great, I love this kind of responses. You have something to talk about. Okay, go forth, take 60 seconds, and try to convince your neighbor. <laughs> well, there's three of you, put your minds together. Most of the natural ways, you know, greatest mass comes from water. So that's why I came from the water. I don't know how much more light has. I don't believe it. He thinks he lives on Mars or something. I don't know if it could be the most soil. It's not part of the wall. It's not part of the wall. Oh, magic tree. Yeah. yeah. So what you say? Uh, it's 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 it depends on how far back you go. Yeah. Depends on how far back you go. Back with sunlight. If you want. <laughs> sunlight is. Yeah. Photons are massless. Yeah. Photons are massless. That's my greatest Okay. That's a good word. So, he is a big plant. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. I think water. You pick water? Yeah. Okay, the plant guy picked water as well. Oh, good. Yeah. What'd you guys come up with? Don't cheat it. Don't cheat it. Yeah. 
designed to be But it's a certain kind of addressing this conception. That's the idea of your I got this wrong. That actually, a guy asked me to this question. Rate of revote? You tried to so what would you come up with? I mean, if you voted as a block, what would you go with? Water? Okay, let's revote. Let's revote. Same question, we're gonna revote. <coughs> And I was just telling them, by the way, I was uh, at the Smithsonian um, one time, and Philip Sadler, who's a well-known um, science educator, came up to me and a bunch of other people and asked me this question, and I totally got it wrong. So, but I learned my lesson. That's a great clicker question. Pardon? Never forget it now. I never forget it now. Exactly. That's the idea. That's what we want our students to do, right? In a low-stakes environment, get this, figure this one out. Okay. So after discussion, you guys are now in the E and B category. Okay, all right. Okay, and um, somebody, so there's, I heard some, there's a water thing over there going on, and then on this side we had some um, E people. So Paul, you had an explanation you were sharing with people? Yeah, the majority of the uh, chemical composition of the tree is carbon-based, okay. and that's coming from it pulling carbon out of the air. Carbon <laughs> out of the <gasps> air. You are so proud. And photosynthesis, you had the right word there. You just had to take it. Okay, all right. And real experts argue with us about this, but the point is that, right, it's something that on the surface is, hey, everyone knows about trees and acorns and oak trees, and is there something in there that you can find that can be a useful question to get people's attention? All right. Um, I need you to pay attention, and if you have some pencil and paper handy, um, we're going to need that for this activity, okay? So you can use the back sides of your green sheets for this, okay? So be ready to write when I tell you. So just get your stuff ready. You can't write. First, I just need your minds on it, and then you'll get a chance to write, okay? Just another usage of clickers. Everyone sort of ready? Okay, all right. So don't write anything now, but for the next, um, let's see, 15 seconds, I want you to look and memorize as much as you can from this. Just absorb. I'll give you 30. You guys, you know, Marcia, you have a screen right there. And that's time. Okay. So write down as many as you can remember, count that up, and then use your clicker to send in your number. And I'm going to put it in number mode, one, two, three. So you should just be able to now put in a number. So as many, write down a list of however many you can. You didn't get a screen sheet? I see. My clicker doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> no points for you then. Uh, I am out of pens. It's OK. Wait, wait, no, no, no. We, we must have you participate. <clears throat> Okay, that's time. Okay, so I need you to please go ahead and um, count up however many and then go ahead and put in a number. You'll, so you'll use the scrolling to do a number and then hit send and it should, you should be able to enter a number, a numeric number.
Now, there is a mode in here if you want to block out. If it's like a quiz, you can set it up so it only accepts one response per clicker per question. So if it was a quiz and you know somebody said, oh, shoot, I remember it, and we want to lock her out, they could, then you can do that. OK, so now um, we can look at the data, but we'll come back to it. What I want you to do now, and this is the idea behind this, I'd like you in a group of three or four, put your heads together, come up, what's the aggregate number of all of you together? Okay? You can do it in twos, threes, fours, so there are three, I guess the two of you, you'll have to do it just the two, and that's fine, okay? You can come with us if you want to. Okay. Okay. What's the unique number total that you come up with? Okay. Uh, Mandy, you doing okay? Okay, good. All right. So we're having fun over here. So um, let's see. I'm trying to think how much more. Okay. Yeah, I'll do one more question. I'll do the soccer referee question, and then we'll. Uh, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Okay. Good. Thanks. All right. Oh, the question's not open yet. Sorry. I should do that. Go ahead. OK. okay. So now go ahead and um, just take one clicker and just one person, one group. One clicker. Just one person can send in your group score. So one, two, three, four. So we should only have four responses this time. So you want to do cooperative learning in a large class, right? So this is a way to do cooperative learning in a large class. And also point out to students that working in groups can actually be beneficial. Because probably what each of you discovered was that your group total, the unique group total, was much larger than any one individual person's right, information on this particular topic. So if I look at the distribution, OK? So here's what we got, right? We have, um, so let me put 1.8. I think that was an 18. But 17, 25, 18, 16, OK? Right? And if I go back to the previous question, so this is your groups, right? Each group got decent. There's, you know, 25 might be the group of, no, I guess we had 3, 3, 2. OK, anyway. Um, somebody was really good at this, OK? And then you look at the individual numbers, OK? And somebody hit 12, very impressive, OK? But you got nines, a bunch of nines and sixes, OK? Nines and sixes were the most common ones then, you know, a couple of outliers. You got a 12 and a 5. Um, and so nice demonstration that working in a group is actually beneficial. OK? So that's another kind of question that you could put up there. Okay. Analysis of a situation. Going to go away from the sciences into a very different kind of setting. Okay, and I'm going to run the ABC123. So you're going to send in a string of letters. Okay? Some of you know I'm a soccer referee. And so this is one of these situations where let's go ahead and it's an ordering, right? So all of us in our disciplines have particular orders in which certain procedures to be followed. And it turns out as a soccer referee, if you don't want to get yelled at and abused by the fans, you need to do things, <laughs> even then you'll get abused by the fans, you need to do things in the proper order. The administrative side of refereeing is a huge part that many people don't recognize or realize. Okay, so this guy's Mark Klattenberg. He's an English Premier League referee, and that's a famous Dutch soccer player, okay, Robin Van Persie. I don't think Van Persie is getting the red card. Somebody else is, but it looks like that. So, mm -hmm. okay. So you would, once again, use the little cursor keys and hit send. That was soccer was pretty big at Furman. It was. You know, you are aware. I know of the former Furman grad who was on the U.S. team. No, no, no. Yeah, he was a Furman. Okay. Cool. So I know that women came to lay here just recently. Oh, yeah. 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 I just use logic. As big yeah. as athletics can be at a place like Furman, I mean, all right, much more energetic. 
Getting one more response? Yeah. Okay. Wait. She said DBC. She did the same thing. And then it's Good. Good. All right. So, so um, DABCs, DBCAs, DBACs, and then one person with a DAB. Okay, so there's one person in the minority there, and then a bunch of people said DABC. No, there's no more. No. See, five plus three, eight plus two, ten. Right. So there, that's that's everybody. Okay. In a really large class, if I was doing this, this whole list would scroll, and you could look at all the possibilities. Okay. Again, does it miss? What did you put in? DACB. DACB. Wow. That is weird. Uh oh. Okay. Well, Mandy's hearing all of this, so if there's any glitches to be fixed, she will. Uh, <coughs> so we got lost a B, and then now we lost a T A C B. Okay. <coughs> okay. All right. So, um, what's the correct answer? So, I and mean, we could have done discussion here, but. But the point of the question is missing information, right? When do you demonstrate by using the technology that your deeper knowledge is that you never summon substitutes because if you're sending people off, that means that's why I showed the red card, right? Red card means a team plays short. So if this was a referee clinic, if anybody answered C, we'd fail them immediately because they clearly don't know the basic laws of the game, right? But it's, the idea is, once again, that the omission of information, right, not putting the C, demonstrates the deeper knowledge. So it takes it away from the multiple choice into the, you know, how do you put stuff together? So the order is important, and then leaving something out is important. Okay, so then think about in, in your disciplines, you know, how, how can you design questions that do that? Any questions on that? <clears throat> Who had the DAB? Imad. Imad's seen the question. He's seen the question before, and I cheated. OK, so that's why. OK, all right. OK, I want to show, um, OK. So what else do I do? I want to show anything else. Um, I want to show you one thing, OK? This is a multi-step thing. So here's this guy. There's a guy called um, Richard Morrison, teaches organic chemistry at UGA, OK? And Richard Morrison teaches organic chemistry. Um, and I don't know any organic chemistry, but one of his questions that he has, and he likes the, these kinds of clickers, is identify this compound, right? Name the compound. And there is a very particular way, right, um, that one goes about naming compounds, okay? And so um, it turns out that the first thing you have to do, and I'm not going to tell you this, I mean, I'm not, you actually have to first identify, na basically number the different locations, okay? And then, in each one of those locations, you have to put one of these groups. Okay? So that little stick diagram actually then becomes, okay, in terms of how you would put it in to the clicker, 3H2GA. Okay? And the actual compound turns out to be 3-ethyl-2-methylpentane. Okay? So a multi-step process. Okay? So a student who demonstrates part of the understanding of how to name these compounds might be able to maybe get a couple of these right, okay? But maybe they don't know the right letter to put on there, so what group? So once again, it gives you a deeper way to look at, okay, do they understand something like this and do this on a large scale? Okay, and the student is also getting feedback about their own understanding because this is something they would be required to do on a test, identifying organic comp naming compounds in this particular way. Okay, so it's one of, the, it was one of the nicest uses I saw of the eye clickers with the screen in the early days. Um, okay, and then my question really was, you know, can you think of a multi-step process like we did with the, you know, with, with the soccer question and this question, where by having a string of letters and characters, students can demonstrate something. Okay. All right. Hope that gave you a taste, those of you relatively new to clickers. Um, the last piece of um, business is, of course, feedback, because without feedback, one can never improve one's performance. This is one of our mantras around here, we keep saying. 
So if you'll kindly fill out the, the green sheets, grab any more drinks that you'd like, and um, I can take a couple of questions if there's any additional questions from the floor. Based on your experience, yeah. what, what would you suggest? Because I've heard some people giving credit or not giving credit for the answer. How yeah. much do you think? I think low stakes credit um, has worked well for me. Okay. Low stakes credit. So some participation type credit, okay. Um, occasionally, maybe if they are, you could get them to work in a group and say, okay, this one's actually going to count, and all of you can work together and solve this problem. It's a little bit more difficult. But um, usually, I've, I've usually primarily used this as a participation type of grade, or just said, like, okay, 5% of the points are going to come from, as long as you answer 80% of the clicker questions, you'll get 5%, you know. Bonus points, basically, kind of added on someone with the other. Okay. And, and do, you, do you know if there are databases of because good clear questions are very hard. Are, are, are some that kind of polarize. Exactly. So you don't have like ten percent of each, but more like a, I don't know, 30, 40 percent, and you can enhance the discussion with the neighbor. So in physics, we're very lucky because people have been doing this for a while. And so we have lots of resources where this one is polled is, is a great place. So there are databases of really good questions um, that um, people have been funded. People have gotten NSF funding to design. There's a website called Assessing to Learn, A2L. Okay? And it's um, actually a bunch of people. Illinois. The, um, well, Jose Mestre is there now. But you know, Jose Mestre is old group at, when he was at UMass Amherst. They got funded to produce a whole bank of quicker questions. Okay. So yeah, physics we're lucky. Um, chemistry's coming along. Um, some of the other areas, and she'll tell us about more areas. There, now. There's a book that was published about three years ago by Derek Bruff called, it's all about writing questions about eye clickers. Yes. That expands, it's across the discipline. So I know we have some colleagues that are in history and um, business here, so yeah. There. So this book, Teaching with Classroom Response Systems, um, and they, he's at Vanderbilt, and they actually have a pretty good, so we point to their clicker website from our, our, our website, the Big U Center website, um, and he gives good design considerations. The work, of course, is still designing the questions, right? So that's where in physics we have the advantage of people have already had these questions that are designed that, that work reasonably well. So, uh, but Derek's book is a really good one for thinking about from different perspectives how people design clinical questions. Yeah. Jeffrey, you see uh, applications in your area? Yeah, potentially. Okay. Yeah. Great. I'll just say, are they using it a lot in psych? Um, yeah, like general, so intro to psych. Okay. There's a lot of, you know, are you here? So there's a tendency. To, but also, like, are you getting any of this? Yeah. Basic. Yeah. Kind of, basic. Um, yeah, basic concept questions. Okay. But I can see how you could use it in, in higher level classes as well. Yeah. 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 That's what I tried to give you a taste of. I mean, the higher level class questions, right? are probably further up in the Bloom's taxonomy. So once you go getting into people trying to do analysis of things and other kinds of things, it requires more work on the instructor's part to design those things, right? But it is possible. And you don't need the technology. I mean, Marcelo was saying that he's in some classroom where there isn't a standard screen, right? He's just got a blackboard. But there's no reason why you can't write, just write the question on the blackboard, right? Or you could just have them open up the textbook and just say, hey, we're just going to answer question you know, 22B from your textbook, and just use the clicker to collect the response, because then that's what you can work with in terms of people working. So. And would it be fair to assume that students would keep the clickers for the whole academic, the whole academic cycle, or they would just write it for one semester? Or people, um, so as when students, when the word gets around to those students, especially COSAM and STEM majors, they know that they're going to use them in a bunch of classes. So they tend to just buy it so that they'll know they'll, because they hear from their friends, chemistry uses it, physics uses it, you know, some engineering classes will use it. So then they'll know they'll get three or four semesters out, right? If they're taking intro psych as a, you know, just a re distribution requirement, just a you know, general ed requirement, they say, oh, I may never, I'm never going to use this again. 
but a lot of those psych people may have been chemistry majors, so maybe they'll, they kept it from there. So it's hard to say, but students come about the clickers in all different ways, including some rent it, and then, but they, and they can sell them back too. And there's a, there's a pretty brisk used clicker market out there. That's, you know, in the student economy, not in our economy. So, um, yeah. All right, well, thank you all for playing along. Appreciate it.